Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's 6.01 p.m. Uh, I am uh, Richard Wee uh, from the law firm of uh, Richard Wee Chambers. Um, uh, we have a comment here uh, from BAC's technical team. Try to mute your Facebook if you're watching Facebook on your other mobile and your other laptops. Huh? Uh, this is the technical team from BAC put a comment. Thank you, Virat. Uh, this session... Um, organized by my law firm, Richard Wee Chambers, together with uh, BAC, Brickfields Asia College, uh, using their webinar. Thank you very much uh, to BAC, particularly to uh, the owners of the chairman of BAC, Mr. Rajasingham. I, I think he's CEO of uh, BAC, Rajasingham, Mr. Rajan, and Ms. Julie, who's uh, instrumental in getting this thing up. Also, thank you for the technical team of uh, BAC, who you just saw uh, popping up with a comment. And... Um, it's not easy to get uh, these uh, five speakers, uh, but we managed to get it. And in fact, there are many more uh, esports uh, uh, stakeholders which I wish to interview, uh, maybe from the association, from the government, uh, the other companies uh, like Orange and whatever, you know, even uh, AgriMind. These are people involved in esports. I, I hope to conduct interviews with them. Now, this, um, this, uh, this, the structure of our webinar is, is going to be like this. We have one and a half hours. Uh, it's, there's a reason why, because it's a big topic, big issue, important, and we have uh, five speakers. Um, I will first invite every speaker to introduce themselves, uh, giving you about a minute to talk about yourself, what you're doing, your company, your association, your organization, uh, and your interest in esports. Thereafter, uh, we will then zoom into the three topics. I will repeat the three topics of our discussion. We'll take one by one. Uh, some comments, uh, some housekeeping to the speakers. When one person speaks, try not to speak because the, the clash of voice will affect all the listeners who are listening in. Uh, and then if you are speaking a little bit too long, then uh, I may just put my hands up and ask you to kind of wind down so that the other speakers may, may, may take a turn. But I, I trust all of you. Like, you guys are all good speakers. You will know when to stop. Um, and then at the end of it, at about 6.15, 6.20, the last 15 minutes of the show, we will do a Q&A. Okay? Now, to everybody who's logging on, thank you very much. We have 36 people. Thank you. Thank you. And on Facebook, I understand there's a few hundred people from every single page. I saw uh, Benny sharing. Uh, I think uh, Alan shared. Everyone shared. Uh, Clement, do you share on uh, Pantheon? Yep, yeah. sharing it. Yep, okay. I... But I'm holding a watching party also on my personal page. So uh, it's, uh, it's going viral uh, at the moment. Now, um, yeah, on my page is about, uh, uh, well, 50 over people on my page and RWC was another 100 over there. So the, the numbers are going up as usual. Now, um, without further ado, uh, to me, uh, the issue of esports has been very important to the Malaysian economy. Uh, it is a significant uh, industry. Uh, and now, um, all the more reason with all the lockdown and the current uh, impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, we see the significance of indoor activities. And one of it, of course, is esports. Um, and from what we have gathered so far, the information we have so far, uh, throughout the world, there is a worldwide rise uh, in the utilization of esports and the engagement of esports to the point that even the share value of certain companies, which we will discuss later, has risen or has risen. So um, I would like to now invite each speaker to uh, share your, your uh, background, who you are, and then we'll start off. Can I start off with Miss Constance, please? Constance, all yours. Hello, hello guys. My name is Constance and I'm from MacPlay. MacPlay is an eSport and gaming community platform where we help activities for them as well. We also help uh, business to target those youth and young adults if they want to target those youngsters for their marketing. So uh, basically, uh, uh, Constance, you are, you are leading a company called MacPlay, right? Uh, involving in that. Yes. Well done. I've been following your progress. Well uh, okay, so uh, one more thing is that whenever one speaker speaks, try to mute your one because to avoid the clash of feedback. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, Constance. Huh? Sorry, sorry. I, so when you talk, I mute myself just now. Yeah. Can I invite uh, uh, our friend from, uh, formerly from Air Asia? Uh, very rare to see you not wearing a red hat. Um, my buddy and my friend, 
now uh, joining a new company. Congratulations to you, uh, Alan, for your new appointment. And can I introduce to all of you the very well-known Mr. Alan Pang. Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Richard, for inviting all of us here. I'm Alan, the Regional Head of Marketing and PR for EVOS Esports, the largest esports organization in Southeast Asia, the leading one. We've won numerous esports titles, including champions, world champions in Mobile Legends Bang Bang and also Free Fire. Uh, we have over 300 gaming influencers across Southeast Asia with 65 million YouTube subscribers and a total of 50 million Instagram followers and 350 views per month. And I'd um, like to also share that we've raised a Series A investment of, excuse me, 4.4 4 .4 million US dollars back in November 2019. And uh, we also have esports teams in Malaysia, PUBG Mobile, and also a Singapore Malaysia team for Mobile Legends. Thank you. Well done, Alan. Actually, the, I think the esports community will be watching uh, EVOS and your growth in uh, the due course. So good luck, you know. Um, can I introduce uh, uh, one of the first persons um, I met uh, in, in, in the involvement in esports? Uh, my good friend who is running his own uh, arena, uh, formerly in uh, USJ. Now he has also set up a giant of a really big one in uh, Johor Bahru. Uh, uh, my good friend and my buddy, Clement Bleed Hui. All yours, Clement. Thanks, Rich. Uh, okay, so my name is Clement, uh, also known as Bleed in the community. Uh, I am the uh, business development director of Pantheon Group. We started off uh, business in 2017, and right now we are expanding our business. Uh, we're more of a retail. Uh, you can call us the eSport team park if you like. Um, uh, we cover some marketing as well in events. Uh, right now we have uh, two active outlets, which is in uh, Topan Johor and also Nilay Mesamo. Well, not active due to MC. Yeah. Yeah, well done, uh, Clement. I, number one, I look, I actually, as, as I told you, I really wanted to drive to Johor to uh, attend your opening ceremony, but we had a lockdown. So there you go. We'll, we, the time will come. We will go and visit Pantheon in Johor. And uh, number two, I look forward to the uh, reopening of Pantheon in Klang Valley. As you know, my law firm, we actually go to your uh, place to play games, you know, <laughs> especially the uh, AR. So look forward to it. Now, uh, this gentleman, uh, next gentleman is a very well-known caster. Um, he's got a really good voice and it's uh, virtually um, um, synonymous for every tournament to have this person's voice appearing in the tournament. Um, there are many good casters out there and this gentleman is of course one of them and uh, he's also been a member in ESM, the uh, principal eSports uh, e Malaysia Association on this and uh, I believe he will bring much value in our discussion today and of course with his very good voice. Uh, can I introduce to you my good friend and buddy, Muhammad Flawa Farouk, all yours. All right, thank you so much uh, Richard for the introduction. Uh, hi guys, my name is Muhammad Farouk. Um, but most people in the esports scene calls me Flavor. Um, I started off my esports career in 2012 as one of the very first esports commentators, not just in Malaysia but also South Asia. And currently, right now, I am the head of communications, the communications director for Esports Malaysia, as well as the CEO of my own talent agency uh, to ensure legality of my uh, actions right here as a talent for the esports scene. Yeah, that's all. Well said. And then, of course, with that distinct voice of yours. Um, <laughs> The next, the last, uh, uh, not, but not least, uh, this gentleman. Um, of course, in, on the esports community, people used to poke fun of him uh, because he's also uh, a hawker seller selling a really delicious uh, chakoy, chakoy in Ipoh. And I'm from Ipoh, so I didn't realize all the while when I was growing up, uh, consuming the chakoy was actually his mom and dad who were selling it. So when uh, it's one of those places I have to go back when I'm back in Ipoh. And this, but more importantly, in the world of esports, he's one passionate gentleman. Um, he's he's the one of the strong, uh, if not the strong person behind Epic in Parrot last year. He was epic, lah. Epic was really epic, huge, uh, momentous, and really uh, pushing the boundaries. And now he's uh, offered his services for a long time as a consultant, guiding new wannabes and new uh, interest in esports. Uh, without further ado, can I introduce to you my good friend from Ipoh, 
and the Taiko, as we call him, Chakui Taiko, oh. Mr. Benny Tay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Benny. And of course, I think Richard did most of our introduction already. Um, yeah, I'm the owner of the, the Hollywood Chakwe in Vipo. It's just a small store. And of course, uh, I've been advising the previous uh, state government in Perak in terms of strategic implementation and development in esports. And of course, um, me together with YB Howard, uh, we masterminded the, the first esports conference in Malaysia, which is called Epic. And I believe um, everyone here in the webinar has been there before. So, uh, and until today, uh, I still do a little bit of uh, consultation work. Uh, I think they, they pro bono, some are getting paid. Um, but of course, um, I, I've been giving a lot of unsolicited advice to, to all the newcomers trying to, you know, go into the esports and tell them how to do it properly. And, and of course, at the same time, also teaching in uh, FSA Academy, which is held by Mervin Lai. Um, yep. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Benny. As I mentioned, Mervin, I've been following the progress with you and Mervin. I think uh, excellent job there. I think Mervin has really captured a um, a grey area in esports, and I think his effort to train people, coach people, and start an academy like that uh, is something very noble. And of course, you know, it's a it's a business. We can earn some money, but the more importantly, is the intention is noble. So well done. Now, um. Let's uh, zoom into the topics uh, that we are discussing. We have, we have quite a lot of time. It's only 6.10. We have until 7.30. Uh, but I, 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 want, I, ask, I requested from BAC for a longer time uh, because we have many good speakers here. And as you can see, those, uh, those, uh, those of you who locked on at 6, 6 o'clock, you hear what they're doing. We have five different uh, people from five different areas of esports. Uh, and they are specializing in their own areas. Now, the first... Uh, uh, issue that I wish to touch on um, uh, is this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we know now the COVID-19 is uh, unrelenting. Uh, unfortunately, many of our fellow human citizens around the world has fallen. Uh, and un unfortunately, I think many more will fall. I and I really hope uh, it will stop, but it looks like it, it won't. And uh, the consequence of uh, the COVID-19 is we'll, we'll see that all of us are stuck at home. I mean, look at us, six of us talking to each other at home and we should actually be meeting at some mama and chatting now, you know, we, we, and we do that all the time. So the world has changed and so is business. And uh, there is this impression that esports is making tons of money. You hear people saying that, oh, no problem, esports, very good, very good. You know, like as if esports people now suddenly all can drive Bentley after the COVID-19. So first things first, um, the topic of this uh, uh, webinar is about commerce of esports. Now, why did I choose the word commerce? Uh, commerce is, of course, is an all-encompassing word. Uh, it, it deals with every aspect of the industry, uh, the business, the investment, the, uh, the regulation involved in it. So there's a lot of uh, issues to discuss on this commerce of esports. Firstly, first topic, and I will invite um, uh, Benny first because we'll... we'll We'll start from where we end. Uh, Benny, what is the impact so far you've seen on the, uh, of COVID-19 pandemic on the current esports tournaments, particularly the offline tournaments, tournaments like the International, uh, KL Major, etc., etc.? What is your observation so far? All yours, uh, I, Benny. I think the, the most immediate and obvious effect is that uh, most of the events could not do... Uh, any more offline events that we move everything to online. Um, which kind of, if you think about it, it kind of diminished the, the, the brand activation in that sense when everything has to do uh, online because you have less space to advertise, you have less space to do more activities compared to the one in offline. So if you think about that, uh, well, would it be a disadvantage uh, at this moment right now that we can't do that much? And of course, if you think about it, Esports and the sports is not that much difference. It's still a game that are uh, very based heavily on the emotions of the fans, the, the atmosphere of the of the event itself. So without these kind of elements, uh, what kind of events uh, that we are looking forward to? Could it be a bit more mundane? Or could it be, you know, um, in, in the way that we think we, we think we could make it work? However, on the bright side, if everything was supposed to go digital, right? Would it meant to have a lower barrier entry for brands to actually come in, considering that doing an online event is much more cheaper than having 
doing one in Aldata Arena itself. So would that be more encouraging for brands to come in? But that is, of course, speaking in context of uh, where no conditions is, uh, I mean, every condition is the same without change. So if you take into consideration of the, the economics or even the, the uh, after the recession or even some may say the Great Depression is happening. So will that even affect sponsorship in, in the future considering esports is very sponsorship reliant at this point. So this is observation that I've been seeing right now, whatever happening in the esports industry or even the tournament itself. Well said. Uh, I think you set the tone there, Benny. I think everyone knows that it's much cheaper to run an online tournament. But of course, we've also seen the humongous growth, especially um, the, the international at Shanghai. That was huge. You know, it's a, almost like a f- football and Olympics tournament, you know, football World Cup and Olympics tournament. Now, um, flower, um, or flavor, sorry. I, I don't know why I always call, always call you flower. Flavor. So um, you are involved in directly in tournaments, you know. Um, your, your voice, as I said, your commentating, your casting, um, especially your commentators, you know, you've been a uh, significant aspect in every tournament. What is your observation so far with all this uh, lockdown and COVID-19 on tournaments? All yours. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for the question itself. Uh, now, let's try to understand the situation first. As much as we see there's a lot of uh, rise in terms of people getting into gaming right now because people don't have a choice people have to stay at home the only thing that's left to do right now is just to game at home right that's the only sort of entertainment that you have but when we look at esports right here uh we don't see much physical events going and that's already been highlighted by benny already or there's not much space for people to actually advertise do any activities and much more um but when it comes to talents and tournaments going on right now the only thing you can resort to is just online tournaments and lower cost, yes, but not as impactful as a physical one right here. But here's the good news. Good news is at least there's a little bit of financial aid to talents who heavily rely on esports tournament to get a little bit of money into their pockets. All right. Not much, not as much as physical events, as you can see. But of course, it's a little bit of something right here. Uh, I think um, we recently also had uh, this tournament called Slangor Cyber Games, which was uh, an initiative by Menteri Besar Slangor and organized by IO Esports where they managed to actually raise uh, a huge amount of money for charity for uh, for the whole COVID-19 pandemic in, into, you know, sourcing money so that they can actually assist more. May it be for, you know, getting the, the medicine or whatever it may be used for. Um, but it can't help to say that because we are in, how do you say this, we... We're just like any other sports out there, but we're just lucky enough that because esports actually live somewhat in the digital world, which revolves around online gaming and internet, that we're still able to run compared to any other sports out there. They can't run football right now. They can't run the NBAs. They can't run Formula Ones. We can still do FIFA, but online, we can still run Dota 2, CSGO. We don't have any of those uh, issues going on in an on online tournament state. Uh, but all in all, uh, lacking. It's lacking because uh, the number one problem is because this is a nascent industry. So when it's a nascent industry, uh, pe- brands, which a lot of people have spent years in convincing to joining esports, are now having their, how do you say this, uh, trust uh, being shaken right now because it's not easy to actually invest in something with all this going on right now. And there's not much room for you to come in. But the positive of it is the only place you can invest in when it comes to sports right now. And there's no other place that should be right now. I mean, not, not undermining that sports, but just saying that this is one of the big options that you have. I, I like what you said, uh, Flower, because, uh, you know, uh, the funny thing is flavor. Uh, I held a webinar on this uh, issue of impact on uh, sports business about uh, five weeks ago, four weeks ago with uh, two gentlemen. One of them, you all may know him, uh, Julian Jackson. He used to work in Manaski. And uh, he had commented that uh, esports is definitely an area which uh, uh, sponsors should look at investing now. But of course, they need to know whether it was the value in the esports. So there will be some rush investment, but uh, he expect he expect there to be a rush. And true enough. So what he said four weeks ago has happened. In the last few weeks, you've seen some new companies going into esports, especially for sponsorship. So well said, uh, Flavor. We'll come back to you. And uh, uh, Clement, you know. Uh, 
uh, we have seen the tournaments being cancelled and then of course the places like Pantheon, like yours, even uh, your rival, like the Battlestar Arena in PJ and there are many other major esports centres. They're all affected when tournaments are closed, you know, and there's no place to go training like your place. Uh, people can't go to your place on the weekend to just, you know, the past tension. Uh, so basically you have a beautiful centre but nobody, no one can visit it. So what has it been impact on this uh, to you so far? All this cancellation of tournaments and all that. What are the impacts uh, has been on you so far? All yours, uh, Clement. Uh, the impact has definitely, uh, I would say, impact us a lot. Because <laughs> um, uh, we, we are, like, like I mentioned in the introduction earlier, we, we are like a team park, you know? We sort of have like uh, different sections for people to enjoy. Uh, gaming together, not just only esports. It can be just gaming. Uh, but because of uh, we are we fall under the entertainment category, where people gather around uh, as a, in a venue. Um, and I believe even if the MCO is lifted in phases, uh, we are still going to have to. I think we're going to be the last category to reopen back, because uh, our, our nature of business require is to allow people to gather together. Uh, whereas um, uh, other business might be like retail, maybe where I purchase something and that's it, I, I go, you know? And for us, it's gonna be really, really difficult and, and hard. Uh, we have to, we have to uh, be very, very patient. Um, and knowing that uh, not a lot of people, uh, our, our business is going to be the last to be open. Uh, but having said that, uh, for us, I think the best we can do right now is, uh, as what a lot of people is doing, uh, giving a little bit back to the community, you know, um, giving some things uh, through online, digitally, um, supporting as much as our business partner, as much as we can. Um, and actually, it's a good time to um, collaborate with a lot of parties that we didn't have a chance before. Um, yeah, I, think, I think that's the only thing we can do right now. Um, Excellent. Yeah. I can see that actually your company does have a direction. Um, of course, you, you already made plans based on what you think will happen. Uh, and tonight, I think the Prime Minister is supposed to come online at 8.30 to announce, which I think he will extend the MCO because the numbers haven't really... It's dropped, but we need to drop to very, very low before we can open again. I think people don't realise, especially the Americans who are protesting in US, that they want to go back, they have a right to go back. Uh, one person get COVID-19, all will come again. So back to you, I think you, I can see you're already planning the future. So well done. Um, uh, to, 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 be fair, to, to, to be fair, I, I hope, uh, I, I indirectly hope that the MCO will extend. <laughs> Some people might hate me for this. Um, due to, because I want to have a safe place for all my, um, my, my, my customers, my patrons to actually enjoy, you know, and not go there and worry whether I'll get infected or not. So if everything can um, slow down, then we properly open back. And, and trust me, I have so many customers this Texas. When you guys going to open back? When you guys open back? But um, I mean, what can we do? I just want a safe place for all my people to, to enjoy gaming together. Yeah. Well said, Clement. I, I saw uh, Flower giving you an applause. I, I agree. You know, uh, I think the correct approach is spot on that... Uh, the safety and security and health of everybody is paramount right on top. Everything else is number two or number three. Uh, so well said. I like the fact that Pantheon has that in your mind, your principles when you do a business. Well done. Now, my buddy, uh, Evos, uh, from Evos, Ellen. Ellen, uh, you're new in Evos. You just joined Evos, I think, less than a month ago. Um, but even in your time at your former company, what was your uh, observation with regards to all this cancellation of online, uh, offline tournament and what, what is the impact has been on tournaments so far? Because I remember you were even leading your own team in Asia. So maybe you can give some observation there. All yours, Alan? Well, I totally agree with the previous speakers. Like what Flava mentioned earlier, uh, tournaments like F1 have even taken their eSports uh, online digital. And guess what? Just a quick plug-in. Um, the F1 digital initiative for eSports is actually led by a Malaysian too. And uh, his name is uh, Dr. Julian Tan, based in the United Kingdom. So uh, props to him for helping out on the F1 scene for eSports. And uh, we also noticed that uh, because, like earlier mentioned by the other speakers, when the offline tournaments are gone, um, sponsors are kind of like uh, 
having second thoughts because they want direct engagement with the fans on physical uh, on a physical level. But since it can't be done, they now have to reallocate their budgets to reconsider even digital. And uh, some brands out there are still very um, conservative on the digital front, but I believe they will open up. As you can see now, even the out of home OOH billboards, you spend X amount of six figures on a billboard, but no one's going to see it for the next three to six months, for example, until the vaccine is really out and uh, we are um, surviving in a new normal. So uh, definitely, I believe um, esports events on ground will have an impact, direct impact to it, but uh, they need to straight away pivot onto the digital side. And we've seen some tournaments being done, especially with the Ministry of Youth and Sports doing a great job with ESM, our Electronic Sports of Malaysia Association. And they've been doing uh, tournaments online. And I believe they are on the second round already doing it. Correct, correct flavor? So um, definitely, we see more brands will be considering esports once they understand and see, did their homework and see the stats that um, gaming and also esports has taken off in a way. More fans will be stuck at home. And if you can't watch a physical tournament, you definitely watch the online one. And uh, just to also address a remark by uh, Eric Kaur on uh, Facebook Live just now, he mentioned that gaming and esports is different. I just want to address that. Yes, that's true. Um, in fact, there are more people playing gaming, gaming at home, right? Spending more hours. And uh, there are also more people watching esports content. So that's the difference between esports and gaming, definitely. Thank you, Richard. Oh, uh, I can't hear you. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I think. Uh, well said. I think I can see that you you've already observed your observation is actually quite quite spot on. Uh, I mean, I share your observation too. Uh, when it does look like um, gaming at home is the new normal, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, Ellen. So hold your thoughts. I have many more things to chat with you. Uh, Constance, you know, we'll, we'll come one round back to you. Um, uh, you've, you've been involved in esports for quite a while now. Um, what is your observation so far with all this cancellation of tournaments and, you know, all, offline tournaments? What is your view so far? All yours, uh, Constance. So far, as Benny mentioned just now, offline tournaments will be hold uh, for the time being. But you can see shift in market that will benefit Twitch uh, YouTube and recently launching Facebook gaming, gaming app. So these are the new areas that will coming up after the COVID-19. In fact, right now, it's started already. And not just that, uh, to further strengthen uh, gaming in to further strengthen gaming in digital wise, we have to further strengthen on the need for 5G as well in hopes to overcome the cross-regional latency issue. So we can make even bigger online uh, tournament online. Yeah. I, I guess um, we have to look at the infrastructure, like what you say, Constance. I mean, we all want to do everything, but if the country is still using StreamX or 3G, then we can't move forward. Mm. I, we are quite fortunate in Malaysia, especially on, in the major cities, our internet is fairly effective, uh, it's mm. especially over the last two years. I think under the former uh, minister, he tried to do something, and um, yeah, it's been improving. Yeah, it's been improving. So let's hope mm. that it continues to improve. Any, anything you, you want to add on on that, Constance? Mm. I think so far, other than 5G is important, um, more and more website from my observation, it became more interactive and more fun to get their attention, especially on websites, on advertisements, the marketing needs to be more and more effective for the youngsters to know what's going on. Yeah, Thank I you. noticed that Constant, you mentioned the word youngsters a few times. So I suppose in your view, uh, the industry of esports, the commerce of esports, uh, one, of the, one of the driving factors and driving force behind it are the youth of Malaysia. Are, are you saying that? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, I, I saw you nodding your head. So. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, you'll go to the next topic. Just uh, some uh, comments uh, here. So far, ladies and gentlemen, we have got 40 people here, 36, uh, 34 apart, uh, attendees. Thank you so much for logging on. And on, um, on Facebook, uh, we've got more than 100 people. 
watching go up and down and then uh, there's so many comments. I've seen 100 over comments on the page. So it's, uh, it's really very active on Facebook. Imagine if we could go, do this live on Twitch, you know, oh my God, it will explode even more. Now, uh, flowing from that, looking at tournaments cancelling and then uh, like Constance rightly put, there has been some new investment, some new uh, interest coming in uh, into that and then some of the companies are tweaking the way they do their business. Um, what is uh, your comment, uh, uh, Constance, um, when it comes to the issues of uh, uh, investment and implication? For, you're, you're, very nicely, you mentioned about uh, uh, maintaining the... Uh, uh, sorry, how some companies have evolved, they change, you try to adapt to what's happening now. Um, what, what are your observations about the investment and the, uh, the business of esports itself? All, all, all yours... Uh, um, uh, Constance. Uh, Constance. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, okay. So maybe I can uh, this investment topic to Benny first because he's more uh, he's, he has more experience on this. Okay, Ken, no problem. Yeah, so I was just following the flow. No problem. Come back I was just following the flow. So, Benny, um, mm. so, Benny um, uh, we have seen, uh, we have seen uh, you uh, yourself have been talking you about investment talking many about times in your very own webinar recently webinar, with YB so Howard and Vera. Um, yes. we, we've seen that. We've seen that. Um, uh, hang on. Uh. Okay. Uh, so, what, what is your comment so far? With the, what, what have you observed with regards to investment of esports and the business of esports? All yours, uh, Benny. I think the the most of this one, um, if you are talking about even organizers, do we really need investment in that sense? I think they are doing well on their own. Uh, they are able to to make their own profits and uh, you know, expand from there onwards without much investment. So if you are if you want to talk about investment, I think more likely we focus back to organization itself in terms of teams and everything. Um, which if you ask me, um, the the effect of COVID may not have uh, such an immediate effect right now uh, yet, mainly because due to uh, the teams that successfully raised fund, they have their own funding to actually, you know, keep on going on the operations and everything. Um, but the thing is that, um, and I've been drawing a lot of parallel between esports organizations with startups, uh, mainly because both of these teams, uh, both of these things actually relies on um, raising funds, uh, you know, a bit, the equity funding or crowdfunding itself. To actually go on rolling and running. And I think uh, EVOS has successfully raised, I think, 4.1 million in Series mm. A. Quite I think, money, yeah. mm. I, if I'm not mistaken, they are the, the first team in Southeast Asia to raise that kind of money. But here's the thing um, the, what I may sound later on may be controversial a bit, but if you look at the, 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 patterns, the, the patterns between startups and um, esports organizations, right? Um, if I, I think I based the, on this article by Fox last year, it was one year ago that there were reports that they are top 12 most valuable esports organization and there's only one team that's making positive cash flow right now and all the other teams are actually running on you know uh, most of their operation fees at the moment right now. So if we talk about organizations uh, in Southeast Asia, um, we have to think about how many of them actually have a sustainable business model to actually generate income for them. And I think given the fact that investors today are a bit more conservative, uh, mainly to the fact that, you know, we have rework happening, we have policy happening, we have certain startups that bail out, like, you know, uh, after raise funding and they just declare loss all, all of a sudden. So it might set to a uh, mindset to the investor like, okay, you know what? This is my money right now. Okay, if you want me to invest in the organization, you have to tell me that, you know, how I could make money, how I could make it back for us. And Investor has been more conservative in that manner. Uh, we, I don't think we are going to have more mass uh, in, in the future. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing. But organization, the difference between esports organization and the startups is that esports organization have price money to actually pay their players. So their burn rate, I think, in my opinion, it's not as high as the, the startup that we are having here right now. So, if you ask me, will it in fact investment in the future? I think the organizations have to rethink how they want to talk to the investor. They have to rethink what are the values that they're giving back to the investor. And that's my observation of all this file. Um, 
COVID, I couldn't com I couldn't comment much on that because that will take some time before the effect will take turn. Yeah. 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 Well said, Benny. I think you've already observed the uh, investment flow of esports. Uh, well, well, I I can see the, the observation. I listening from you. I already learned a few things already. The last one minute. Thank you, Benny. You know, uh, Alan, um, you are your your company, um, Evos, as uh, Benny mentioned, or is already receiving a substantial amount of investment. So, which means there are people who believe in the product. They trust the product. Um, uh, moving forward, and uh, particularly with this background of uh, lockdown that we are going through, what do you think will be the general principles adapt, adopted by companies like Evos to continue to gain more investment into esports? What are the kind of things you will you may take? What the principles that you may use to attract more people to come in and investors? All yours, Alan. I feel it's also about cost savings, you know, uh, hunkering down right now, um, especially those who have a lot of other businesses are just going to compare. They have a lot of uh, overheads in terms of their properties, rentals, etc. So for us, we still can do stuff online. So that's very helpful. And uh, we are basically, as long as you got a PC or laptop, mobile, you're on the move, you can make things happen already. You're not uh, limited by the physical location per se. So for us, uh, even just last week, we just signed a major deal with Lazada, and one of the biggest e-commerce platforms in Southeast Asia, uh, owned by Alibaba. We have a one-year deal with them as a main sponsor, and we also have other sponsors on board, um, such as uh, Axis, a telco in Indonesia, uh, Ax, uh, the deodorant, Potme, uh, it's a uh, fast food, and uh, Sucro, Top Coffee and JT Express. So you see, um, there's still a lot of uh, money coming to the scene. It's just a matter of uh, how you pitch to the potential sponsor and uh, getting the trust. Because uh, even if you read all the reports online right now, a lot of marketers are saying that, oh, they're stopping spending for the next Q1, Q2, and uh, wait and see attitude, right? And then there's the other flip side of the coin, other sponsors are saying that, oh, we need to have a top of mind and uh, keep on always on approach. So it's really depending. And uh, right now, I believe uh, for sponsors and potential sponsors, it's not about sales, 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 not just about selling a product. I know we understand that revenue is important for every company, but it's also about your brand building, brand love, and uh, connecting with your fans in the right way and for things they care about. And especially now for the millennials and Gen Z, it's all about uh, safety, brand safety. How are the brands uh, connecting with their audiences via these uh, hard times, you know? If you're going to push to an um, audience and saying that buy my stuff right now, you know, for X amount, uh, everyone's like, hey, we're saving money here, you know, we're being safe. Why are you pushing it to us? So I believe uh, it's all about the approach. And uh, for us, uh, thankfully, Evos, we already kind of like pre predicted, uh, even at the end of last year, we predicted that it's going to be a slowdown this year in terms of the economy. And this uh, black swan came in, COVID kind of like uh, make it worse. So we actually like, we're prepared for it as an organization and we have uh, good people on board EVOS um, three of them actually are Forbes 30 under 30 recently since uh, last week it was announced especially like Ivan Yeo uh, Michael Vijaya Hartman Harris and Wesley Yu the co-founders of EVOS and they have uh, various experiences in the world of uh, VCs fund management uh, movies and uh, talent management so definitely uh, it's impacted it's just a matter of how the teams are going to pivot right and uh, how you're going to talk to the brands to convince them that now's the best time ever to um, put some marketing budget or ex ad spend in terms of experiential marketing. Mm. Yeah. Well said. I, I, um, because Evos is uh, directly involved in these um, tournaments, you, you have, I remember uh, reading somewhere, Alan, you even own a few teams. In fact, you have got some very, very good teams other than your other businesses, correct? That's right. Um, we have teams based in five countries right now. That's in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam. And uh, right now, of course, um, to be fair, is uh, we are impacted in terms of movement because usually we do a lot of content, not just in the house, but outside of the gaming house, right? And now you're just stuck inside. So we need to like think of the, out of the box and uh, find new ways of how to engage our audiences. Yeah, it's not just about 100% just gaming every day, right? Because yeah. uh, esports audience, they want to see behind the scenes, the life of a streamer, 
of a esports professional player yeah i think basically uh, at this moment uh, if i can draw strength from my last uh, discussion on sports business um i think one of the most important thing in my view is to get to do fan engagement i think it's very important uh, and of course i think some of you will know i'm a big fan of everton football club um so in 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 england everton has actually been running humongous com- campaign to serve food to reach the people they are reaching to the poor people the old people who are staying alone in england uh, they even get the football players to pick up the phone and call the fans and say hello how are you i am duncan ferguson blah 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 so it, it keeps the players uh, the, the the fans happy and the engagement will will make people love the club even more so i think evo should consider uh, doing that you know uh, if you're not lah yeah uh, we are in fact um just to share with marketers who are not really aware of esports and you're tuning in right now to this stream uh in traditional sports your david beckham per se plays on the football pitch for 90 minutes for example and he does an interview with the media but that's one way right the fans can't really interact with them on a daily basis for example but for evos we have uh, great talents and you can the david beckhams of evos for example if i say they can interact with the fans uh, always on it's not just a one off kind of thing right and you can like uh talk to some of our influencers like emperor uh, dylan pros angel and jenny's and uh you talk to them and they respond to you so this is a difference between uh esports uh, gaming versus traditional sports and uh you can see that happening even the traditional sports like you said right everton and all the profe- the football club players they are even playing fifa against one another yeah so they realize there's a a power pool attraction there and it's uh more interactive with the fans Yeah. In fact, talking about that before I move to flower or flavor, sorry. Uh yesterday Everton beat Chelsea 8-0. Our player <laughs> Andres Gomez uh, played uh people if only that happens in real life, you know. Yeah. So okay, flavor uh uh you know, we we you've seen um, the tournament stopping. We discussed earlier the observation about on offline tournament stopping. Um what have you seen about the impact on investments? You know, you you are one person who be observing all the time. You see it happening. um so with all this uh, um uh, stopping of basketball sepak takraw badminton all cannot go on people are all coming towards esports uh how do you think this will impact the investment and whether it actually is a good investment uh, to get so much people coming in into esports all yours uh, flower All right. Uh thank you so much Richard. Uh now we're talking a little bit about invest investment in esports. Um I understand that since all the other sports are actually having issues where they can't run, right? Because there's all physical and then esports you can actually run it online without having a physical event as well. But that does not mean that people are desperate like now I have a lot of money and I can't place it in that sport. Let's place it right here. Now but now they look at esports and anything and should I invest in this? All right? So I listened into a little bit of how Alan described the whole thing. I think this will be the best time for us to show that this is the best time for people to invest in esports. And it is all up to you guys out there. May you be um esports organizations, uh, organizers and much more to convince people uh, how you can actually place money into the esports scene. May it be uh esports organizations or tournaments per se or invest in having esports team and much more but of course it becomes a choice now when we discuss all this we see that there's not much room to play because um the only place to place all this is only esports but even in esports there's not much room to play because it's only online right if we were to compare to back then you can actually have uh, physical activations you can have um, physical appearance where people can engage one to one to all these people uh you can see brand placements you can see this everywhere uh, it's in malls where a lot of eye and much more but then when you're online the only space you have is either uh static logo placements uh transitions or ads videos uh and other means everything's online right there all right and and because of this there is space but not as much as physical investments can still come in but not as much as before now basically the value gets smaller unless you're an amazing businessman we can convince them to actually give more than a physical event then you're just purely amazing but of course money is still there coming in uh it's just that it's not going to be as big as how it was before with physical events going on and much more so the pot is getting smaller um as you can see there are a number of Esports tournaments going on right now, not just in Malaysia but also Southeast Asia, all across. 
um, but price pools are getting smaller because people are don't have uh, can't, can't afford to actually put in hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, USDs into tournaments anymore because there's not much for them anymore. Now, because you always have to remember, whenever people put money into the pot, they always want to ask, what do I get in return? Do I get exposure? Do I get money back? Uh, do I get any cream in my social media presence? And much more. And if basically it's a business kind of thing, if you can actually convince the other person to actually invest this much of money, you need to convince them back that you can actually get the amounts worth as well. So that's how business works. Or even more. Yeah, per se. Well, I I think your, your observation is uh, really good. I, I like how you clearly see how the flow of in and out on this. You know, on that point, uh, Flavor, in fact, uh, on a personal note, uh, as you know, I'm quite an avid esports lawyer together with my ex-colleague, Brian, who's also online. Hi, Brian. Um, you know, we, we try to help the tournaments. We try to help uh, whatever you all know. We, we try to assist in uh, what uh, rules or tournament, regulation tournaments. But another aspect of our work, which was incidental to what we do, was people coming to us to see investment, uh, and whether they can uh, uh, purchase over a company, a merger takes over. It's been very interesting because uh, whenever we do business uh, or, or as a lawyer, we do a uh, merger of sports or buying over of sports, uh, but the character of e-sports e investment has a different character. And we've noticed that difference in how we approach it. Uh, and, and I can see that, uh, in fact, um, it is not the same, like just buying over a normal uh, football team, for example. There are many considerations. Like, for example, if I'm buying over Allen's a company, Evos, there's so much uh, layers of uh, matters to deal with. So uh, interesting. I, I like how you observe things, uh, uh, Flower. Thank you. Uh, so, Clement, before we wrap it up with Constant, you know, Clement, you, ironically, you are an investor. Your company invested a lot of money in a, such a beautiful uh, esports center in Johor. Maybe you can share from your personal point of view the impact of this uh, COVID-19 on your company's investment and how do you, what are your plans and what are your, as I said earlier, what are the principles that you intend to apply moving forward? All yours, uh, Clement. All right, thank you, Richard. Um, I think put it this way, uh, as an investor, we, we, there are two types of investors. Uh, one are the short terms, one are the long, uh, longer you know, the vision, uh, the way they envision themselves in the investment that's like maybe five to 10 years to come. Uh, we are that type of investors. We, in, we envision ourselves on what we can become within the next five or 10 years. Um, actually, in fact, if we're talking about investment, uh, some of you may know, actually, we're actually uh, going through, uh, we actually just, uh, we were going through a few rounds of uh, fundraisings and stuff like that here and there for our Pantheon Group itself. And in fact, actually, um, government itself, I'm not sure if you guys know, but government itself actually came up with some programs. It's called MySIF, uh, where actually they, uh, they support you with uh, how much money that you raised. Um, they give uh, a, a ratio of one to two. So example, that means that if you are raising, uh, if you raised up one million, uh, the, the government will come in as an investor for 500,000. So uh, from from investor point of view, uh, if you're looking at a, a business which you're planning to invest for longer term, actually right now is a good, uh, good time if you have more money. Because why? Uh, this is the time where you start to demand things, you know? It's like, I want, I want bigger shares, you know? I want, I want more uh, extra benefits uh, here and there, right? Uh, so, uh, and some companies, they might actually need that cash flow. Uh, uh, they might really need it quite urgently, you know, because uh, not all companies actually have a, 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 what do you call, a, a backup plan or backup money to, to last for the next six months or maybe the next year. You know, some of them are, are very dependent on the retail sales. Like us, uh, we are actually quite dependent on the retail sales to cover uh, back of our, uh, some of our overhead costs. But uh, well, lucky for us, uh, we have good investors, and um, we, as you mentioned, we are investors ourselves. We look for the uh, uh, five, uh, five to ten years to come. So, uh, but if you if you talk about this, uh, definitely impact us. We, we, I think everyone here should be my my industry impact the most. <laughs> we basically can't do much. Uh, but as as I mentioned just now, uh, we, we try other ways. We, we have to be, uh, you know, a, a lot of friends will say, you can't, can't you go digital? Can't you do uh, rental services or stuff like that? Uh, we can. Um, but the, the, the money that we spend 
on all these equipments, it's, uh, it's too much and uh, the risk is too high for us to actually uh, rent out all the equipments. And there, there's not, uh, there is some um, insurance coverage that actually cover this, but uh, when you do the mess and everything, it's just not worth it, you know? Yeah, it's totally not worth it. Because, because one set of our equipment, just one whole set, um, excluding the chair, easily goes over 10,000. We have like 100 of them in each of our outlets. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard for us. Uh, let's rent a 10K set for 500 ringgit per month. Yeah, it, it helps a bit, you know, but then uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, I, it's, not, it's not, it's not the thing that we're going to go. Right? Mm. Well, I mean, we might consider, uh, but like if, if today, you know, Richard told me that you want 10 PC, yeah, why not, you know? But if today a, a random ABC, uh, no offense to anyone, but hey, I want to rent a, your 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 best gaming equipment. It's like ah, oh, what? Am, and it's all about risk management, and this risk is really really high. Yeah, so it goes both ways. Uh, but like I said, uh, if we're talking about investment, um, if you really have the extra money and you're looking at something that which is which I think I believe a lot of people are uh, is looking towards the uh, so-called esports or gaming industry within the five, 10 years to come, this is a good time to start considering uh, to invest. Uh, and because like I say, you can start small, you can see what digital can, uh, what digital can bring you. And when MCO has been done, uh, or, or, or when MCO ends, you can see how it actually impacts the offline, uh, offline market. Yeah. Mm. So that's from my point of view. Yeah. Can you yep. hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's interesting how we hear from a because you you're both you are in you're trying to attract investor and you yourself are investor. So I, I can see that actually your timing very unfortunate. You're doing very well, investing very well. Now you have to review how your investment is. But it's good, at least uh, hopefully what you just said will um, you know will inspire other potential uh, new investment or companies who are running esports now, thinking what to do. Uh, etc. etc. Very good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to come to Constance soon. We have seven questions, very good questions. We're going to come to all your questions uh, shortly. If you have any questions, type down your questions. We will go through it later and try to attempt to answer each and every one of them. Constance, you know, um, I'm, I've always been very intrigued with Mac Play. I always uh, try to understand uh, and uh, more about Mac Play. Maybe can I invite you to talk about what you are doing with Mac Play? Um, how you uh, attract people to come Correct. and support uh, MacPlay, invest in MacPlay, et cetera, et cetera. All yours are constant. Just maybe you can just share with us more about MacPlay. All yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Richard. So MacPlay, uh, MacPlay is an esports and gaming community platform where most of the people know it's an app. It's an app where you can download from the App Store. And we also help we also help those players, especially for the casual players. They wanted to go up to the next level, like into the national um, team. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. They need branding. They need exposure. They need more practice. So they come to Mac Play. They come to Mac. They come to Mac Play. They can get. Uh, they can go for our online competition. And some of the revenue we are focusing on is also on the ticket, ticket size of that. Yeah. So other than that, let's say I have uh, 500, 500 players is playing for PUBG, for example. And we can, we also do article and media for the companies that they wanted to target on these people. Let's say they want to give some offers or they want to give some discount or attention to the youth. So the youngsters and millennials knows the company. Mm. Uh, for, so, so this for, is what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's very yeah. interesting because you are actually scouting new talents, new talent. finding new talents, mm. finding new talent. and making them into future esports uh, uh, champions, uh, you know? Champions. And I, I like the part mm. you said that, like you, even you, said that you, you even teach them about, you're, you're, them you're basically about grooming them. them. Isn't it? You're, you're basically... Yeah. Uh, you're basically grooming them and making them better uh, and before you unleash them to the tournament, correct? Yep, 
So other than that, because they need exposures and not much of the people know, some of the people knows as spamming only. So we give them a real media for them to cover up like what's, hap what's happening on the last tournament, who versus who, and who got the first place, and how's their tactics and movement and their tips inside. So they can teach people as well. Interesting. So um, basically, uh, when so with that business model that you have, um, how do you attract uh, investors, especially now, you know, with the current uh, lockdown and everyone is very tight with cash. What are the kind of investment you are looking for? You know, maybe you can share with us because such a, you, your, your, your business model uh, in esports, uh, Constant, is totally different from Alan, Clement and Benny's uh, idea. And you are definitely not, no, nothing like uh, Flavor. Flavor is a totally different uh, area in, in esports. So maybe you can share with us, how do you attract uh, investors into your area of business? Thank you, Richard, for the questions. So our, our, our method to get attract investors is through our communities because they see the benefit of growing a community, especially in esports or gaming industry. Community is very important for them. Mm. And also, it's not just... Also, it's not just... Um, working out activities, but I also have to find, we have to find new methods uh, to how can we go, how can we catch up on our revenue as well? Mm. Mm. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, um, I'll come back to you. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I have to mute you sometime because there is a feedback. So, uh, sorry, to, I, that just now I had to mute can, you. Can, can. Through, yeah, okay. So, uh, very interesting. So, so far, ladies and gentlemen, it's already 6.57. We got half an hour more to our webinar. What have you heard so far? Um, in the beginning, the five speakers share with us their observation on the cancellation of many tournaments and the enhancement on the online tournament. And they even share with us uh, the consequences of uh, uh, this uh, enhancement of the online tournament and the closure and cancellation of the offline tournament. Uh, then when we we when we we went towards the, the business and the commerce of esports itself, the the investment, the uh, sponsorship. So Benny uh, gave us a big picture. What what is it about? He quoted Forbes magazine the amount of money coming in. We heard Alan sharing his company's uh, evolution, what they are going to do for the next few months. The people behind Evos, the kind of money they want to pump in uh, into the business. And Clement being a unique position of seeking investor and himself is an investor owning an esports center, going through the worst possible time to open a brand new esports center, but nobody can come and play. Um, well, he shared with us that the, the company is, is evolving, they're changing and, and, and get, getting ready for the impact. And Flava, or Flava, Flava has given us his direct observation. He sees for himself how tournaments are changing, how investors are thinking, what's my value? How much money can I get? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, Constance, with a very unique business platform of MacPlay, share with us for how they, she, uh, she does a business to attract talent and investors into it. Very interesting so far. Things which traditional sports will never talk about is, you know, <laughs> Manchester United, uh, NBA, Boston Celtics, all would have this kind of uh, business um, uh, uh, framework, right? Now, flowing from there, um, our last question in area is actually, to be fair, it's more of a legal matter. So I, I don't expect the five of you to have an a in-depth uh, uh, point of this, but maybe more of an observation. With all this happening, have you seen the impacts on the contracts? What are the impacts of contracts? Anybody complaining, you know, I cannot perform. You, many of you are reading now, uh, sports players, athletes, they are asked to take pay cuts. Uh, some of the sponsors of tournaments in, in other sports, uh, they, they can't invest anymore. They're stuck. So, uh, you know, Flavor, maybe I can start with you this time. Oh, what are your observations uh, pertaining to uh, the impact on contracts uh, that you have seen so far? If you have seen any, all yours. Contracts, because uh, I understand that contracts are meant to be followed. Uh, uh, and... You know, when, when all this is going on, I'm very sure a lot of these uh, organizations start to change their contracts because they have no choice. 
uh, some people have really, let's give an example. Let's say, for example, if I actually have all of you as part of my organization, I'm supposed to pay Clement a certain amount of money, Richard amount of money, monthly on a monthly basis. But then because operations are not running, especially when it comes to esports, there's no tournaments for Clement to perform. There's nothing for Benny to join in. There's nothing, no, no, nothing that Richard can actually contribute to the whole organization. Hence, there has to be changes in contracts. And much more. So, but I'm not sure whether or not contracts have been changed. It is subject to the contract, you know, the clauses that we have within it. Much more about that. But um, the thing about contracts going on right now, uh, I think uh, there's only room for changes. Uh, there's only room for changes right now to just fit into the whole situation because we need to understand. We need to understand. We need to create a win-win situation for everyone. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to. Everybody, when, whenever people talk about money, it's always about the money part. All right. Uh, we need to understand that people are not doing so well during these times. People are losing jobs. Mm. Uh, a lot of people have been like, oh, we're not talking about hundreds of people. We're looking at hundreds and thousands of people in Malaysia, millions across the whole world itself. So people are having a hard time. So uh, I would understand that there are a lot of people who are angry towards their employees. Uh, a lot of people are very, uh, it, it saddens them to be let go. I wouldn't be surprised that let's assume that if this whole quarantine were to extend as far as another year due to unforeseen circumstances, right? Uh, if I was working under Clement, under Pantheon, one day he has to give me the bad news like, bro, I'm really sorry, but we have to let you go. You know, right? Like, <laughs> I understand, bro. I understand. Uh, it's a hard time. Um, contracts and all this uh, aside, I'm very sure. But you know, just just be wary of the contracts that you're 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 buying to. Uh, read through. Make sure that you know what you're signing, which is very very important. All right. But if you're lucky enough that the contract says that you still get money despite anything that happens, a typhoon, a tornado, you're you're in, you're in a great contract, but yeah. <laughs> and that the lawyer who drafted it for the person is very good lawyer. Then it's a you know, very so. good lawyer. <laughs> it's not protecting the employer; it's protecting the employee. Yeah, yeah. actually, from my my business, of course, we have seen some impact on the contractual side, and some esports uh, people have come to us to ask for some uh, advice. So it's quite interesting. You know, on that point, um, uh, Alan, what is it? Because you are running company and you're running a, a team, sorry. Um, what is it, any impact on your contracts so far? Any Anything that you've observed? Any impact? All yours? Uh... Yep, so far, so good. Um, of course, we prepared for it for, for this year, uh, for, for potential economic downturn. So, um, so far, all contracts are still signed. And uh, yeah, I always want to say this, uh, Richard, don't sue me. <laughs> That's our personal joke. Of course, Richard's a lawyer. Uh, he helped me previously with other esports contracts even before I joined EVOS. So yeah, so far so good. And uh, I believe it really depends on the back again to the team or the organization, whether are they really prepared for this and do they have enough cash flow to survive? Or like one flavor mentioned, you know, if you don't have enough, you have to do what you have to do, right? So it's pretty normal in any company. And for us, uh, yeah, thank thankfully we are prepared. I think it's very important. An international company like uh, EVOS uh, must have a, a, an effective contractual management. Uh, it's not just, you know, people must remember, uh, and you remember, Alan, when we were working with you in your previous uh, engagement, it's not just uh, drafting an agreement and getting people to sign, it's managing the agreement, managing the contract, especially after signing it, you know. Uh, and many people assume lawyer's job is just to draft a contract. No. Mm. We go beyond that, you know. But um, anyway, that topic is, today's topic is not about uh, uh, my, my firm. It's about you guys. Yeah? So it's very interesting to see that EVOS has been prepared. Huh? And you just joined yeah. them and you can see that they are, they are only well managed. Right? Their contracts are well managed. Well done. Yeah, and just to add on, um, even as we go through this pandemic, uh, we're actually even giving back to the society in terms of like giving face masks. We gave about uh, 50 over 1,000 face masks around Southeast Asia. And also campaigns like the, if you buy, if you donate, in example, a hospital in Thailand, the approved one, the appointed one, uh, we'll give you a free jersey, a free EVOS jersey. So we're trying to uh, reverse engineering and try to give back to the community mm. when okay. they do good. Okay, well said. Um, Clement, you, 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 because you just started a business, uh, well, actually your business has been around for a long time. We just happened to start a new center in Joho. Um, any impacts on your contracts? You know, you have had to go through some, uh, go through the contract, whether there's any force major, whether you can cancel the contract. 
anybody uh, unhappy with your company? What have you observed so far? Uh, I, I will say um, I'm, I'm truly blessed and lucky to have uh, people who is uh, working together with me to really understand the company situation. Um, even uh, I, I, would, I would dare to say that they uh, voluntarily took uh, unpaid leave, you know, uh, just to help out the company uh, without us saying much, you know, because uh, we, when we train our team, we, we train them to understand the whole business. They are not just or a staff, they are basically a part of the business. Um, so we are very lucky that uh, they understand. Um, and also, uh, they are, uh, we are lucky that our government is actually giving some support, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some support in terms of uh, to giving our, our guys who are still with the company to survive, you know, some money to, to survive. Um, uh, so far, we haven't faced any uh, troubles in terms of uh, contracts and stuff. Um, so, like I say, I'm really blessed and um, lucky in this uh, in this situation. Yeah. Basically, I can see Clement your your um, business community. While you may have executed agreements, but because of the goodwill and the good relationship you have with your suppliers and your partners and your people working with you you've all been managed to evade any uh, legal implications so far, right? Uh, I would say so far, so, so far, good. so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so far, so good. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I, I highlight this again. I'm just blessed to have them as a team. Uh, that's you know, I Clement, um, I, this is what my observation as a, as a lawyer. I think uh, in what I've seen so far, businesses which all this while have been running on a fairly good goodwill, firm goodwill uh, with their suppliers, their workers, and their, their partners, they seem to do okay. Right? That means they are, they, they are facing problems, but they are facing the problems together. But I noticed some uh, suppliers and uh, workers, employees, they are very nasty to their employer or their supplier, the, the buyer. And you can see because in the background, there have been many difficult moments with the two of them. So I, this, I guess this, this COVID-19 reminds us all that Always be nice to people. Be like flavor. Always nice to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, even some of our non-operational uh, staff, uh, they, they, I mean, and some of our operation staff even ask uh, if there's anything extra they can do, you know, to help out. Mm. You know, because normally they are more of a, a customer survey, you know, they, uh, customer service, sorry, they help out, you know, teach people how to play here, they guide them here. And they, they will ask like, oh, can I do streaming to help out? You know, can I, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, so, um, so yeah, so like I said, I'm just truly blessed. So yeah, good, good. We, are, we, we skip that process. Very good, very good. Right yeah. There. I'm going to end this with Benny, but before I swing to Benny, so Constance, uh, you know, you, are, you, you just explained to us your business model, you assist talent, you bloom talent, you get involved in all the tournaments. Has there any, been imp any implications on any contracts and agreements since the lockdown? Have you, any of your player, Kana or something like that, you know, they go through some con contractual difficulties, etc., etc. All yours, uh, Constance. Constance. Uh, thank you, Richard. So far, I think uh, we don't have any issue on the contracts, but I think maybe in the future, we might need this service as the, as the team grows more uh, international, the black and white will be more important on that side. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, I, I feel uh, that, uh, I feel that uh, one of the biggest challenges dealing with the esports community is the uh, uh, the Chin Chai approach on contract. You know, uh, many people they understand the value of contract. They know it's very important, uh, but sometimes the way the contract is drafted uh, and the fact that nobody is looking for a lawyer to go through it, it's it's just difficult. Of course, for me. When I comment like that, people say, oh, yeah, Richard, of course, uh, you comment, you want business. So I don't look for me, uh, look for other lawyers. The point is go and look for a lawyer. Don't have to be Richard Wee. There are many lawyers out there. But uh, you're right, uh, Constant. I think uh, esports business must really take must into be. account, seriously take into account legal investment, investing into legal uh, framework. Uh, very important. And look at other sports, uh, football, basketball, uh, volleyball, netball. 
they are all heavily regulated and that's why they are well structured and they are well run you know something for esports to do well well said uh, uh, constant um thank you because um because on mac play platform it is not focusing not very focused on the team where because the focusing on team is part of the bonus for them where they can go and practice they can get more exposure most importantly is in the app we can do a lot of experience uh, experiment with them so we know what to go next so most importantly is to uh, working out uh, more and more experiments interesting interesting hopefully the experiment mm -hmm. will include experimenting with contracts <laughs> yeah, might but, be might be in the future yeah. i think all mm -hmm. the all the lawyers who are logging, there's many lawyers who are logged on. I can see some of them. Hello, all fellow lawyers. Hello. The lawyers are very happy that I am uh, promoting legal services to them. Yeah. Go and look for them. You can see they're there, you know. Um, okay. But uh, sorry, uh, Constant, is there anything else you want to add? So far, so good. We'll come back to you, Constance. When we, uh, we're going to go to QA soon and then we'll wrap it up. Taiko, Benny, you know, um, you, you are, you've seen, the, you are the big picture guy. You've seen the investors, you spoke earlier, you set the tone when you discussed about Forbes magazine, money coming in, what to do and all that. What have you seen so far on the implications and e e impact on contracts and agreements so far? All yours. I think when it comes to contracts, right, I'm not even worried about the established team right now because I'm sure they have paid their lawyers well to all the contract and legality. And, you know, they, they have well, they've been well prepared for this if, because if not, then well with investor confidence system, I think that's one of the questions. But what I'm worried about is not the well-established team. I think it's more to the amateur team, second tier or the tier team. Because for what I know, also I've been receiving feedbacks that there's certain players, you know what, uh, there, there are certain types of teams that, hey, you know what, I like what you're playing, come, let me manage you. But there wasn't any legal contracts in between. So what happened was, um, well, is there any impact? I believe there is, but there's nothing we can do in, in the legal framework because there's nothing penned down in black and white. So that, that, is what, that is what's worrying me the most. And also because um, it could be that, you know, some of them may think engaging lawyer is a very expensive uh, procedure or, or, you know, maybe they couldn't think of this is something that they need to do. So that, that's, that's the general problem in Malaysia right now. So that's for team and the players itself. Because um, we have, I have some friends who are players who got onto the sponsors page. But when I ask them, do you have contract? No, they are, their manager have not given them any contract or they have not given them anything in legality. So I think that that's a very dangerous thing to, to be in, especially if someone is sponsoring you without all of that. But speaking of those, or now we venture into the, the investor part as the organization head, as the organization founder, CEO, in the investor parts. I think before anyone went to raise funds, right, um, make sure you speak to a proper lawyer. Um, may not necessarily have to be from the esports field or, or you know, in that, in that matter, because at the end of the day, when your organization, your view as a business. So get to the lawyers who are good in business, let them have a load, let them advise you how you're going to do it. So all these things you have to do before you go and raise funds, right? And also, um, before raising funds, speak to an experienced VC. They, they should be able to tell you how I can structure your thing to do uh, all this kind of uh, investment and whatnot. But I think in terms of legality, um, we have been through this together, Richard, right? In the Para Esports Council. Um, I think the only thing we can do right now is how are we going to get uh, all this, you know, newcomer, uh, how to literate them in terms of the legality of it. What should you be doing when you're engaging with your team manager, even if you're engaging with your sponsors, they need to know what are the basic strikes of it. And if they are aware of that, then, well, we could actually produce more quality team. But if not, without contract, well, who knows? If I'm going to set up a team, I'm going to disband six months later without any repercussions. Even if you have a tribunal, I don't think that will work as well. So mm -hmm. that that's that's all for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, of course, the part about you saying uh, looking for a lawyer, I I have no choice but to agree with that. And <laughs> but um, on a wider scale of skid things in any industry, we can see any any industry. All of you would can can observe. Every industry require not just lawyers but uh, 
strong accounting support, a strong consultancy support in order for it to continue blooming. Right? Every successful industry, uh, where, like for example, X Games, people started X Games 20 years ago. It became very successful because he had all the correct support. Uh, we, we will continue seeing that. Even look at Airbnb, it started about 10 years ago. People were wondering, what is this? Now it's a multi-billion dollar business all because you had the proper structure, you know? So, okay. Um, well said, Benny. We're going to come to Q&A. We've got 15 more minutes. Um, uh, we have some really good Q&A. Because we have got so many questions here, I cannot expect every speaker to answer all questions. I hope the speakers don't mind. So, I will look at a question and I will point to a particular speaker who I think may be able to answer. But if another speaker wants to add on, raise your hands and I'll let you answer for maybe about uh, a minute or so because I think we, we want to try and be fair to as many questions as possible. The first one, uh, by the way, two questions have been answered. Question from May May and Elvin Gunawan has been answered by Clement and uh, uh, Flavor or Flower. Flavor. So I think Flower is going to sack me after this. Uh, I'm sorry, bro. I always call you Flower, but everyone reminded me your name is Flavor. So okay. Flavor already answered Elvin's question. Now let's start the first one. In fact, this question goes to Flavor. By Fayez Mahmoud, Full Moon Esports. E How to track participants using hacking script during online tournament? What is the method used by Marshall to avoid unfair conditions? Flavor, when you look at this, you've been there, you've seen your own eyes, tournaments going on. Uh, how do you think a Marshall will take into uh, deal with this kind of situation? Take up on this question. I'm not sure her. I, I, I know whether Clemming actually take up on this. But the thing is, I don't think I'm familiar enough to know whether can we actually track because I've never actually worked as a marshal that you track all this. But even if you can't, all right, because you have to remember there's a lot of game titles. Um, like CSGO, they're very lenient. The whole system can actually detect if you're actually using all these hacking elements and much more. Um, but there are some games where it's untrackable. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, PUBG Mobile is still a little bit shaky here and there, much mm, more. Mm, mm. Um, but you know, even if there isn't, right? Just, just, just be honest and just play normally, okay? Just <laughs> you, you don't want to do all this weird stuff I, I, we have right here. It, it, it's just yeah. ridiculous. Uh, here's the thing: when it's an online tournament itself, there's a lot of things you can actually do. Number one is other than using hacking stuff, I can just register myself as a noob in. PUBG Mobile, and then let a professional player like Clement to actually play on my behalf. They don't know who's behind the cameras, right? Who's in front of the PC and much more. But just don't do it. I'm I'm not giving you ideas, but I'm just telling you there are ways to go around it. But just <laughs> just don't do it, okay? Yeah, it, good, it, point, it, good point. It, it kind of hurts. You know? But uh, yeah. Clement, would you want to try because the uh, flavor feel that you may know better after all? You do own a stadium, you know. All yours uh, on this question. I repeat the question. It uh, from Faiz. He asked you what. Uh, what were the method used by Marshall to avoid unfair conditions? All yours, Clement. Um, there's no there's no bulletproof um, method to actually go through this, but uh, we've seen some tournaments that are actually done um, overseas. Uh, I would say online tournaments. What they do is they uh, okay. You you can't provide you can't provide uh, a way a foolproof way of uh, detecting hack because. Hacking, there's always a way to go around it. No matter how good you are, there's still some crazy guys who actually find a way to do it, all right? But what you can do is, uh, well, this is where the marshal will be. Uh, have to be an uh, experienced marshal or maybe an experienced player, a couple of experienced players first to reveal, uh, reveal uh, the videos of the gameplay, all right? So maybe as, a, as an organizer EO, you may request the players to make sure they have um, uh, they either stream their gameplay or they actually record their gameplay. So from there, if there's any dispute, you can um, check the, the replay yeah, you know, from, so from their evidence. point of view. Yeah, it is uh, evidence. From their point of view. So especially when you're playing shooting game, you know that, that guy head is here and suddenly it goes like that. So obviously we know that's like aim tracking or aim bot, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, um, that's that's one way. Second is like if you're playing as a team or anything. Right now, there are so many apps um, out there that you can actually like like Zoom is one of them where you can stream yourself playing. You know, so there's maybe a way where you show that hey, um, I'm here. You know, I'm track. This is me playing. Uh, okay, so we're gonna play like that. Okay. You know, so so that's one way of um, that that's one way of uh, saying that I'm I'm not being uh, what you call this is what you call seated. Okay. 
yeah, okay. not being seated. Interesting, the way you, your, your, your mind is fixed on how to uh, set out evidence. Basically, you are sorting out and then backing things up. Okay, let me just organize this. Huh? We've got two questions on the uh, webinar here, on Zoom webinar, both by Brian. And then um, the next question come from uh, VJ, Vijin, Vijin Tan. That question I will address to uh, Ellen, where there's a specific question about FSA, uh, EWOS, EWOS, I think. It's about EWOS sport, I think. Huh? Then, uh, th before that, we saw a question from Facebook, on RWC Facebook, from Muhammad uh, Wafiuddin bin uh, Muhammadiyah. He asked a question, uh, and maybe any of you can try this question. Uh, how about esports organizer? How is esports organizer to organize an offline tournament with all this new norm, social distancing, safety issues, avoiding virus spreading, face mask, health screening? Maybe Clement, you can start first. Um, actually, that's 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 a very very good question. That's what uh, me and uh, the team has actually been R and D throughout the the whole MCO period. Because uh, that's actually the first thing that we would do. Um, same thing. It's hard for us to avoid a box. You know, everyone goes in. They go, Shh, you know, a spray comes in here and there to, to disinfect yourself. Um, so that's definitely out of the question. Um, but uh, if I were to foresee, say, we open in the next, I don't know, three months maybe, um, the first thing, we definitely have to do what we are still doing right now. You know, the basic stuff as in, you know, washing your hands, you know, all the sanitizer, checking your temperature. But there is no way to actually 100% guarantee the safety of that. That's why uh, I mentioned earlier, um, it's best to wait until everything dies off, mm -hmm. or at least like it's 1%. But if I were to answer you, I think there's still ways to act for EOS to actually run this. But instead of uh, running more offline, probably they can still go offline for the tournament, okay? But the exposure is more online or maybe mm. a selected VIPs during the offline. So that might be a way we, uh, we reduce it. Um, but like I say, it all depends on the attendees, whether they, 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 uh, they feel safe enough to go to a specific yeah. venue. Yeah. yeah, okay. Benny, you, you have any comment from your consultant point of view how do you deal with this, you know, uh, organizing tournaments with the social distancing? Um, I think my answer would be the same with, with Clement as well. Yeah, um, I think so too. Is, is, is there a lot of choice that we can do right now except doing online? Um, until a vaccine has to be discovered, until there's a cure, then fine, we can do that. But that also will take some time to deploy. But um, yeah, what choice do we really have right now? Yeah, right? yeah. And okay. I mean, I don't have much input into that. Yep. Yep, good point. Okay, um, Brian, my ex-colleague, uh, asked two questions here. Uh, right, uh, The second question was, with offline tournaments slowing down during the pandemic, has acquisition of professional teams by organization and companies slowed down? So, uh, Alan, you want to give it a shot? Uh, Brian is asking, with tournaments, uh, with offline tournaments slowing down, uh, do, you, uh, do you foresee more and more um, professional teams being bought over? Uh not really. Uh, um, yes and no. Depends. Uh, if the esports organization, the professional team, uh, doesn't have the holding power, then for sure they will need to uh, let go of their players and uh, potentially even close down, right? So, it, but of course, depends what, like what even uh, our CEO Ivan mentioned in the, the stream on Richard Wee Chambers' Facebook page. Um, it depends on the business model. So if let's say the esports team is depending on the merchandise being sold as their main income revenue, and right now this COVID thing happened, and you are unable to like deliver goods in time, or the supply chain is uh, impacted, then for sure you need to change your business model. So there's no right or wrong answer. It just really depends on the esports organization and how they uh, handle their business model. Yeah. Okay. All right. I I suppose it's going to be a wait and see, lah. I, yeah. I, I do agree with you. Uh, it's a good question by Brian, but I think if I'm a business owner now for esports, I'll do a wait and see. I won't rush into buying over a, a team yet, you know? Okay. Um, and thanks for uh, highlighting the question by your CEO on Facebook. It's actually quite active uh, 
uh, engagement on Facebook. Now, Brian also asked a question about in terms of investment. One branch of investment into an esports organization is through sponsorship. With the slowdown in tournaments during this period, teams may not have the screen time at tournaments at which sponsors might desire. This might mean that players under an organization might be forced to create their own content a lot more. How can esports organization balance this between the players needing the competitive element and training with the content creation for income generation? I think, Constant, this is a one area you may want to comment. I repeat the question. Brian is saying that because there's less and less tournaments, some players, in order to maintain their income and their, their visibility, they may want to stream even more. Uh, any comments, uh, Constance? Um, there is lesser and lesser tournaments these days. Um, I think it will be better for the players to learn how to learn how to find any other methods to help them sustain as well because that is the most important part in a team and also a business. If people who are trying to create start and start a new business, they have to got to they have to survive first. That's one thing. Mm. Second thing I. My suggest my suggestion on streaming. I think it would be more much more better to create video than streaming because video you can keep it forever in YouTube. Like people will go and watch and watch and watch it. Stream is just that moment. You have that duration of time only. Yes, yeah. I, I I actually agree with you on the last part because uh, I I feel that uh. If you record it and save it, then it becomes like Netflix. People can watch anytime. Uh, yep. Good advice. Good advice from, advice. from Good Constant. Advice from Good advice. Okay. We've got 7 27. We've got three more minutes, but we can extend a little bit more. We're trying to zoom past the question to ASAP. Um, the next question I want to try is uh, Ellen from uh, Wei, Wei Jin Tan. Uh, Wei Jin asks Is it possible to explain a little bit more of the FSA esports mentioned earlier? And do you guys think with the help of such an education academy linked with esports will ever help to grow with esports community effectively? So I think I want Alan and Benny to try this. Alan, all yours? For me, I feel that, uh, okay, just a disclosure here. FSA Esports Event uh, Management is one of our sponsors. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to sound biased later. People will say that. <laughs> so uh, I believe that uh, FSA is doing a great job because previously there was no one in the space, especially in Malaysia, doing such a thing. Uh, let's say I want to find out more about esports. I'm uh, going to graduate soon, or I might want to pivot in my career path. But uh, I don't know where to start. FSA is uh, collating and bringing people together from various verticals in the esports industry, from tournament organizers to shoutcasters. Even Flava uh, is on board as a trainer and even myself previously to share insights and knowledge that you may not find on Google, for example. So it's really great insights. Uh, of course, you don't expect to like get a degree and straight away start working it out. It's more like a course to take to get you exposed to the esports world. And after that, you can decide which way you want to travel and go, go for. So that definitely is a good course. Uh, check it out. FSA Esports uh, Management, the education group. And uh, it's Good. actually, I believe, one of the first in the world doing it. Thanks, okay. Richard. Good, yeah. Um, Benny, you want to try this? Uh, well, I can't speak on behalf of FSA because I don't, I don't own FSA. But I do, uh, I'm teaching all the modules inside there, which is called Revenue Development. Uh, what I brought into the class, right, is something that, um, okay, back, back up a bit. Four years ago, four to five years ago, I was growing startup community in Nepal. So I've been engaging with Magic, I'm that in that sense, uh, in the entrepreneur journey, uh, journey in that. So, and I took some of the module that they have in growing startups and you know planning out the business model, right? And I took it back to FSA and actually teach um, this esports, uh, you know, newcomer on how I got plan this thing out as a business as a startup. Because when I first did the the, the first business uh, business model canvas in Ipo, right? Um, we have around 30 participants and it took four hours to think who is that customer actually. So th there, is a, there is a problem there where, you, you know, eSports organization that, no, we want to make money, but if you don't know who is your customer is, how are you going to make money, right? Yeah. So, and luckily when I was teaching uh, railway development in FSA, 
they were they were they were actually taught you know uh, what the business is all about what the esports is all, all about so the students straight away get okay you know what when you're playing out this business model then of course they know who their customer is they know how to identify this kind of thing so when you have a clear pathway of course you'll be much more easier to actually you know get what you wanted in your own organization or in your own you know, or in your own business so whatever we have taught there may not just be applied to esports you could apply to any other other in your life as well, as well. Yeah. Mm. right all in one so mm. that's that's my point of view that's that's where i would come in actually uh, i'll talk to fsa you know these are things that they need to do so okay yeah all right well said i i it basically is an all encompassing training area academy right good okay we have come to 731 i i can't prolong too much uh, because to be fair there's also fatigue like, there's only so long a person can listen uh, and the, the fact is all of you have given so much information there are a lot of people to to listen so what we're going to do is this all of you have seen some questions even on facebook um uh, i'll invite each and every one of you to wrap up each of us give each of you given a one minute or so to wrap up and maybe while wrapping up we can also address some of the questions and give some comments before we call it a day so i'll start off with uh, flavor first flavor maybe you want to wrap up uh, what you've seen so far and then uh, answer some questions and then give your last say uh first of all uh thank you so much i think everyone who is actually currently watching the live stream i think you guys can just virtually back at home just give a clap to richard we and his team for organizing this together with bac uh thank you so much to all the speakers and all there now um some parting words i think some of the things i wish i actually shared throughout this whole thing is that uh i understand that these are hard times for everyone including myself but uh this is not the end of things there's ways for you to go around it try to find opportunities within all this misery and the gloom and doom right here some people um i understand that for example for example uh esports players and much more since they don't have much tournaments and much more they end up doing uh video contents they end up doing more live streams some of them end up doing uh online courses as a means to actually gain a little bit of money for their pockets and much more uh don't give up uh try your level best practice social distancing because that's the best way to actually cope all this and uh yeah hopefully we can actually run through this together inshallah if there's any way we can actually assist more be more than happy to actually uh assist you in guiding you in how to go through all this yeah yeah that's in fact there. uh flavor i was going to tell everybody here uh before everyone leaves the group and those who are watching live if any of you require any assistance Uh, all the five speakers they have facebook pages look for their facebook pages send them a dm uh, and i'm sure they will help you right yeah. so look for mm. them they they all uh, stakeholders in their own rights huh? okay don't don't do brainstorming outside just stay <laughs> at home stay at home yeah thank you flavor and, and much obliged for your warm words on uh, for rwc and i i wish you the best you know you've been doing an outstanding job and i always said your distinct voice i uh, will always remember your commentary and your caster um can i invite uh, constance to give a summarize word view and uh, maybe you want to uh, maybe you want to uh, make any comments or yours uh thank you thank you richard for inviting me as a speaker for our webinar and it was really helpful for some of my some of my uh, communities they've been watching this free so i hope they learn something as well as as a new as a new course for them Thank you, thank, thank you, you Constant. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank yeah, um, I wish your um, I wish the, the the best of luck, and I'm sure you will continue to grow. Right. Um, right. Um, okay. Let's okay. see. Uh, can I invite Alan? Uh, your maybe your, to summarize um, uh, and make some comments before I, I will go with Alan, Clement, and I end with uh, Benny. So all yours, Alan. Okay, yeah, thanks Richard and RWC for inviting us to join in this uh, special webinar. Thumbs up to you guys. And I uh, just want to summarize by saying that for brands out there, there's a lot of opportunities available in the market right now for uh, esports and gaming. Uh, you can see all the reports, search it online. Gaming has increased like up to 30 or 50% uh, views in total. Millions of people are watching it across the world. So a lot of opportunities out there, and also to quickly address uh, Model Sam's uh, question about uh, what else can sponsors get aside to logo placement, which is uh, 
not just slapping on a logo and also just the video collaborations. There's a lot we can do actually in the esports world. And just to share like even our Lazada um, partnership, we are doing like an online tournament with their fans and also engaging the community by doing a show match in terms of uh, getting uh, the next talent, talent search, you know, on the Lazada's platform. And uh, many more stuff you can do online. So uh, just need to think out of the box. Um, of course, I travel a lot around the world in the US, Europe, and they say, the A word be authentic, you know, and not just about logo placements. So that's what I want to share. Thank you. Before oh, I any... invite um, uh, Clement, I just want to answer one question. As you mentioned, there are many good questions, so I apologize if we are unable to answer all. Uh, I think one of our participants, uh, Adrian Robson, or Robson, I've asked, for those who owns and runs the team, how do you guys go about their compensation on this current crisis? So I, I, I'm not sure which kind of com compensation you're talking about, but I assume it's about losses and uh, maybe uh, unable, inability to enter tournaments, inability to get involved in competition, unable to earn money. I suppose the compensation is depends on if they're involved in businesses, they're involved in the bigger business, they can get compensation from that business to come down. Of course, uh, people can get compensation from government. Uh, they can also try to get complete... Co uh, compensation from, well, you can try with publishers. I doubt you can, but you can try with publishers. Uh, and for those who have invested in the tournaments and tournament cannot take on, legally speaking, you can actually ask for reclamation of your money, refund of your money. Actually, that is actually very possible. So I, I'm sorry um, that we're unable to give you a detailed answer. But if you have any further details, you can contact any of the five speakers directly. I hope that answered the question. Uh, Clement, can I invite you? Your summary and maybe your last say or about today's webinar or yours hey thank you richard uh first of all uh i would like to thank everyone to, uh, who actually attended the, uh, this uh, webinar and also all this uh, little speakers and also to uh bac yeah uh, i think uh, for having us on this uh platform so for those who are viewing right now whatever you do click just stop doing and click follow on richard <laughs> rwc <laughs> Yeah, follow more updates. But uh, yeah, um, I'd like to say to everyone who is new to the industry, or I, I see some new faces, some questions who are basically, they, are, they want to touch base on this. Uh, first of all, let's be clear. Uh, gaming and esports is too new. Okay, so we don't confuse them first. Um, so game, uh, esports is part of gaming. Gaming is like, you know, uh, I would say on a, on a birthday. Okay, so uh, if you want instant ROI, gaming is definitely the direction you go. Uh, I personally think that. But if you're looking for something which you, you want brand presence and, and, and things that is consecutively um, so, uh, in the long term, uh, you, that's where you start to narrow down and go into this part, okay? Uh, that's on my, on my uh, point of view. And also, um, there was one question that I actually wanted to answer. I'm not sure where it went, but uh, I, I think uh, this is not the first time I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to share uh, stages with all these uh, fellow speakers in different different uh, locations. And I always share this uh, during uh, my sharing is uh, esports or gaming is a friendly community. So if you want to uh, go, get into the community, you know, or, or get into the industry, feel free to uh, approach us. Uh, we are that approachable. I, I believe a lot of people is very, very friendly. So um, text us, DM us, you know, find us on any social media platform. I believe we will try to help as much as we can because uh, we just want to grow this industry into a healthier industry and, uh, and have a better exposure. Yeah. So well, yeah, see. thanks again. Thanks, Clement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll uh, end the day with uh, our typo from Ipo. Benny, maybe you want to summarize and uh, attempt to answer any questions on Facebook uh, and here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I think uh, I saw two questions. I think one from Nwendi, uh, what's the point of esports? And also from other Sam, uh, about the, the ways to, to actually penetrate esports as a sponsor itself, right? Um, and, and this is the part that I, I think everyone should notice the difference. The company in America's right, they are really good at marketing. They are really good at selling their stuff. One of the main reasons is that um, have you ever noticed that we Asians are not as good of a storyteller compared to Americans, right? And I think this is one of the principles, this is one of the, the, the verticals that we should look into right now as a brand, 
you know, uh, what message do you want to send right now? What what are you to what are your brands to your customer? So I think the message needs to be very clear in order to touch base with them, or else it will just be gonna be logo on the screen and that's it. That that's all you ever do. And in conjunction with um um this pandemic, conjunction with pandemic, I'm not sure if that's the right word. But anyway, having said that. Uh, with Bank of uh, you know, they predicted there will be a fall in GDP, there will be a 17% unemployment going on in Malaysia. I think we need someone, we need something to actually cheer everyone up. We need that kind of escape mechanism, just as what Hollywood did back in 1930s during the Great Depression. So, uh, if sponsors really wanted to come in, uh, let's try not to just put logo, uh, let's try to be an inspiration, let's try to be a message for everybody who is going through a tough time right now that, you know, we are here for you. And that's how you establish the brand value from there. But of course, if you're looking to pure sales, then, well, perhaps there's a different strategy. But if you're looking in that aspect, then, well, you're in the right time because you may not, uh, it has a lower entry barrier right now. And of course, one of the things is that you need to find a good storyteller in that aspect for your brands to actually go in. And, um, my last, I think I wrap this up. I think everybody stay safe. Uh, it's gonna be a tough time ahead, and um, you know, uh, I wish you all good luck, and I really wish to see everybody from Esports Circle, uh, very soon. I hope, I hope. So yeah, that'll be all from me. Okay, well said, okay. Benny, and good luck with your chakoi. Um, there, there are twenty people left here. I think some people have uh, left the the webinar to go have dinner. But there are hundreds and hundreds of people on Facebook watching us. Thank you very much for following everybody who followed us. Can I invite everybody to give a round of applause, uh, cyber round of applause to the five speakers, you know. They have really, really tried their best to give whatever they can within a short time. And um, uh, it's very interesting. If I can summarize the, the discussion so far, uh, it is clearly from the, uh, the experience and the passion of the speakers. They know their stuff. Uh, they, they are involved in specific they industries. Specific they, industry. have observed, they have observed, they have given ideas. They have, given ideas. They have also given some uh, form of proposals and roadmaps for the future. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we've got the summaries from all the speakers. I will bring this to a conclusion and I will end by saying what I always end in all my webinars so far, that you know we are, uh, we are going through all this together. The country is facing a tough time together. Uh, the pandemic has no... Uh, a sense of uh, race and religion. It attacks everybody. So the only way is that we can get over this together. So I'll end by saying that only together we will prevail. So we must be together to prevail. We will prevail at the end of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a good dinner and I'll see you online. Take care of yourself. Adios, amigos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well said, Richard. Thank you, All thank right, you. Bye-bye. Right, okay, let's go. Brainstorming and Mama. Okay, 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 okay. Let's go. 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 Let's go.